Peggy Hollinsworth was chair of the Faculty Senate and of SACUA during the 1990-1991 academic year when the Davis Margaret Nickerson Annual Lecture was established. Peggy, now emerita, has had a career at Michigan notable not only for her scholarly research, but her contributions both to the university and to the community at large in both service and faculty governance. In the history of the university, she was the second woman to be elected chair of faculty senate. In 1999 to 2000, Peggy Hollingsworth served as president of Sigma Psi, the Scientific Research Society, an international honor society comprised at the time of over 80,000 scientists and engineers. She is also past president of the University of Michigan chapter of Sigma Psi. She is a former member of the Alumni Society Board of Governors for our University School of Public Health, from which she received her doctoral degree, and of the executive of the Alumni Association Board of Trustees of Bowling Green State University, where she received her master's degree. She is currently a director of Bowling Green State University Foundation. She is a founding member of the Coalition for the Advancement of Blacks in the Biomedical Sciences, and for five years, she served as a member of the Minority Programs Review Committee for the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Peggy's contributions in governance and service have been recognized by the prestigious Academic Women's Caucus Sarah Goddard Power Award in 1990, given to women who have made outstanding contributions to better the status of women at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan's President's Medallion in 1991, the University of Michigan Association of Black Professionals and Administrators High Achievement Award, and the University of Michigan Alumni Association Special Appreciation Award in 1992, and the University of Michigan Distinguished Faculty Governance in 1994, and the Jackie Lawson Memorial Faculty Governance Award in 2007, which recognizes her efforts to promote, through good faculty governance, the missions of the University of Michigan on all three of its campuses. In 1990, the Senate Assembly set up the Academic Freedom Fund to support the annual lecture series and related events. Peggy Hollingsworth was president of, has been president of the Academic Freedom um, Lecture Fund since 1991 and has worked with a group of distinguished active and retired faculty members and others both nationally and internationally, to raise those funds necessary to perpetuate the lecture series. The president of the fund serves with the chair of faculty senate and the president of the Ann Arbor chapter of the American Association of University Professors on the committee that selects the annual Davis Marker Nickerson lecture. Everyone I have talked with has basically told me that this lecture, one of the premier events on campus, would not happen without Peggy Hollinsworth. Welcome. Each year for the past 21 years, a distinguished scholar has addressed us on a topic of great interest and vital concern to the academic community. Last year's Davis Market Nickerson Lecture spoke about the corporatization of the university and about the academic freedom implications of the 2006 Supreme Court ruling in the case of Garcetti versus Sabalas. In the case of Garcetti versus Garbalas, the Supreme Court held that public employees have no First Amendment protection for statements that they make in the course of their professional duties. The court concluded that public employees are not protected when they speak, quote, pursuant to their official duties, unquote. In dissent, Justice David Souter wrote, quote, 
This ostensible domain beyond the pale of the First Amendment is spacious enough to include even the teaching of a public university professor. And I have to hope that today's majority does not mean to imperil First Amendment protection of academic freedom in public colleges and universities, whose teachers necessarily speak and write pursuant to official duties." End quote. However, Justice Anthony Kennedy's majority opinion pointedly refused to answer Souter's question, noting, quote, there is some argument that expression related to academic scholarship or classroom instruction implicates additional constitutional interests that are not fully accounted for by this court's customary employee speech jurisprudence. We need not, and for that reason do not, decide whether the analysis we conduct today would apply in the same manner to a case involving speech related to scholarship or teaching." End quote. A significant number of court cases which involve faculty at public universities, such as ours, followed the 2006 decision. Concern with the implications of decision in the Garcetti case for our cherished concepts of academic and intellectual freedom was great enough that the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs set up a subcommittee to draft a policy statement on academic freedom. Other public universities engaged in similar activities. The result was that the statement on academic freedom adopted by the Senate Assembly on behalf of the Faculty Senate in January 2010. The subcommittee noted in its report that their deliberations were, quote, heavily influenced by the writings of Matthew W. Finken and Robert C. Post. In their book, For the Common Good, Principles of American Academic Freedom, which was published by the Yale University Press in 2009, I highly recommend it. Thus, the Senate Assembly's Davis Market Nickerson Lecture Selection Committee was extremely pleased when Robert Post, Dean of the Yale Law School, accepted its invitation to deliver the 2012 Davis Market Nickerson Lecture. As I have mentioned in previous years, today we desperately need Americans of all ages who will join the battle to preserve the academic and intellectual freedom guaranteed by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Needed are citizens with enormous courage that was demonstrated by Professor H. Chandler Davis when, in November 1953, he stood before a subcommittee of the House on American Activities Committee and claimed his First Amendment rights. Professor Davis is one of three former faculty members after whom this lecture series is named. He is here with us today as he has been here nearly every year since the first Davis Market Nickerson lecture. Chandler, will you please stand so that we might recognize you. I would be remiss were I not to thank those who not only have made these lectures possible, but who also have made them so successful. The University of Michigan Faculty Senate Assembly adopted the resolution that established the series. The American Association of University Professors, AAUP, provided a grant to support the first lecture with the proviso that our faculty match the grant. And the directors and members of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund over the years have ardently supported the cause of academic and intellectual freedom and have given whatever they could afford to sustain and promote the series. In addition, again this year, a contribution for the lecture series was included in the philanthropy of an anonymous donor. Some academic and administrative units of the University of Michigan today provide support both in money and in space for the lecture series as well as the organizations and groups listed in your program. The advisory board of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund and the past Davis Market Nickerson lecturers have had a key role in the recruitment of distinguished scholars who delivered the annual lecture. And indeed, Bob O'Neill, who was our first lecturer, uh, made the initial contact with uh, Dean Post. So thank you very much. We have good fortune to have with us today from Michigan Media, the senior producer and director, Scott Mann, Jason Simpson, the media producer director and audiovisual technician, Carl Cole, who each year record the lectures so that they can be seen by those who cannot be with us today. Finally, as Kim has mentioned, the staff of the Faculty Senate Office, Tom Schneider, 
and especially Linda Carr, and the students who work in the Faculty Senate office to provide the necessary staff and logistical support. This year, the students who assisted us were Caitlin Carmadell, who a master's student in public policy, a candidate really, Jonathan Davis, a master's candidate in information technology, Megan Williams, a master's candidate in social work, and Carrie Bawashik, a candidate in public health. And now, law professor and dean of the law school, Evan Kamaker, will introduce this year's University of Michigan Senate's Davis Marker Mickerson Lecture. Dean Kamaker. Thank you, Peggy. It is my great pleasure today to welcome and introduce Robert Post, the dean and professor of the Yale Law School. I've known Robert for longer than I care to acknowledge, uh, perhaps first from reunions as former law clerks to Justice Brennan, then as fellow traveling faculty members on the West Coast at law schools, and most recently as decanal colleagues co closer to the East. Uh, Dean Post is a most appropriate choice for this year's Davis, Marker, and Nickerson lecturer. Robert has written brilliantly on the subject, and indeed I'd venture to say that he is probably the preeminent scholar in the nation today on the constitutional influences on and implications of the concept of academic freedom. More generally, he is a highly influential scholar and public intellectual with respect to the nature of democratic constitutionalism and the intersection between law and politics that undergirds it. As you will soon experience, Robert is an absolutely wonderful lecturer, exhibiting both mastery of content and eloquence of word. You're all in for a real treat today. I'm not gonna dwell on his very impressive career trajectory and accomplishments, as those are nicely captured in the brochure you have before you. Instead, focusing on biography, I'm gonna offer a comment on Dean Post's character and commitments. With respect to character, Robert is just about the nicest, warmest, most genuine person you'll ever hope to meet. Personality traits that make it hard to imagine he could be a successful academic dean. It is surprising to me, maybe even shocking, that even an extensive Google search uncovers no good dirt for me to share. In this day and age where I know every Yale Law School student experiences life through Facebook and Twitter, that's a hell of an accomplishment. With respect to commitments, I believe that one of the secrets of Robert's success, first as a scholar and now as a leader in academic administration, is that following the exhortations of his former boss, Justice Brennan, he marries reason with passion. Robert's positions are carefully considered, nuanced, well thought out after much apparent internal debate, drawing upon the teachings of various disciplines and of history. That's reason. At the same time, in his work, there is clear evidence of a relentless drive to improve and perfect, to define an ideal and push us to reach it to commit to making a better world, passion. In many academic and professional contexts, Robert has married reason and passion so as to point the way to a better place and inspire others to join for the journey. I think Robert has clearly taken to heart one of Justice Brennan's other exhortations about living a good and valued life. Quote, to strike another blow for freedom allows a man to walk a little taller and raise his head a little higher. And while he can, he must. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a consummate thinker and lecturer and my friend, Dean Robert Post. Okay, well that is plainly an introduction I'll never live up to, but thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to say first, it's a great honor to be here to give the Davis Margaret Nickerson lecture. When uh, Matt Finken and I wrote uh, For the Common Good, the book that was just referenced, we dedicated to heroes of uh, academic freedom like H. Uh, Chandler Davis. So it's a great honor to be here in your presence and to talk about this uh, subject. So academic freedom, as you might know, uh, has two different dimensions. One dimension refers to the matter of professional self-regulation. What do we do when we govern ourselves as an academic community? We are committed to the principles of academic freedom. In this sense, academic freedom applies to every university, and it applies um, across the board as a matter of how a university should govern itself. It's in that sense 
that the recent statement approved by the Michigan uh, Senate is committed to academic freedom as a set of professional ideals. But there's another aspect to academic freedom that Peggy Hollingsworth was just talking about, which is academic freedom as a constitutional right. This is not a matter of the academic profession and how we should govern ourselves. This is a matter of what is in the United States Constitution, and in particular, in the First Amendment. And that's not governed by what, by what we, as academics, happen to think is right or wrong. As a constitutional matter, academic freedom applies only as against the state. So it applies uh, uh, when any university is suing the state because of a law of general applicability, or it can apply when a faculty member is suing a state university, because when the uni a state university acts, it's acting as the state. So I'm going to be talking today about the constitutional dimensions of academic freedom, the kind that Peggy was talking about when she was talking about the Garcetti case. Uh, what are uh, the constitutional rights of academic freedom? How do we understand them? We know that they exist. The Supreme Court has often told us that they exist. The Supreme Court has said, to quote it, uh, academic freedom is a special concern of the First Amendment, which does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. So we know that it exists, but what is it exactly? And as to that, anyone in the room who has studied the constitutional law of academic freedom will tell you in an instant it's a mess. Uh, the decisions are in disarray, they are chaotic, nobody can untangle what actually uh, the principles of constitutional academic freedom are. As one eminent commentator has remarked, and I'm quoting now, there has been no adequate analysis of what academic freedom the Constitution protects or of why it protects it. Lacking definition or guiding principle, the doctrine floats in the law, picking up decisions as a whole does a barnacles. Um, I think that the constitutional law of academic freedom is incoherent because the courts lack an adequate theory of why academic freedom should receive constitutional protection. Um, insofar as the courts do have a theory, um, it has been articulated as the marketplace of ideas. So the Supreme Court of the United States has announced, I'm quoting, the classroom is peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. The nation's future depends upon leaders trained through a wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. So the court thinks that when it protects uh, constitutional academic freedom, it's protecting the marketplace of ideas. And what I'm going to be arguing today is that that is incoherent, that that's just plainly wrong. The marketplace of ideas theory does not, could not, justify any defensible theory of academic freedom, first. Second, I'll try to give an alternative foundation for a constitutional theory of academic freedom. And then third, I'll show how this reformulation of constitutional academic freedom can solve many of the puzzles which now uh, render constitutional principles of academic freedom incoherent. So those are the, be the three parts of my lecture, if I have time. So to understand any of this, one has to go first to fundamentals. And the most fundamental fact on the table is the modern university. If we have academic freedom, it's because of the nature of what a university is. Uh, most of you in this room will find unexceptionable uh, or even banal Carl Jaspers claim that, and I'm quoting him now, the university is the corporate realization of man's basic determination to know. Its most immediate aim is to discover what there is to be known and what becomes of us through knowledge. If you go on the website of any modern university, you will find some mission statement that includes increasing knowledge, disseminating knowledge, preserving and distributing knowledge, some knowledge-oriented uh, mission. Now, we should understand that that concept of the university did not always exist in the United States. In uh, colleges and universities before the Civil War in the United States, uh, higher education was basically a matter of character training. Colleges existed to instruct young men in the received truths of theology, of, of, uh, of divinity, of character. Um, and it's only when Americans began to travel to Germany in the second half of the 19th century, and they began to see the ideal of the German research university with its Wissenschaft goals, that they began to come back to the United States and say, you know, college isn't just about a finishing school. It's not about learning a good character and, you know, where to place the bread and the drink and never get it right on the table. It's instead 
about increasing knowledge. And so it was a great and decisive moment in the history of American higher education in 1885 when Daniel Coit Gilman, who was then the president of John Hopkins University, the first university fully to internalize this new mission, could address the assembled officers, students, and friends of John Hopkins. And he could state with confidence and at length that the functions of the university are, he says, quote, the functions may be stated as the acquisition, conservation, refinement, and distribution of knowledge. It is the business of a university to advance knowledge. This is now, so this is the foundation of academic freedom because the professional ideals of academic freedom in the United States did not begin to emerge until universities had first assumed or transformed their function into this knowledge creating function. This happens at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And as universities begin to shape their mission in terms of creating knowledge, American professors began to think about academic freedom as an ideal related to that new mission. Now, professional academic freedom um, has four dimensions. One dimension is freedom of research and publication. I'm free to research what I will, to discover the fruits of my own research, to publish them, meaning to distribute them to the public or to my students. A second dimension is freedom in the classroom. I'm free to teach as I wish. Third is what we call freedom of intramural speech, freedom to participate in community governance, to differ from the university administration. And fourth is what we call freedom of extramural speech, the freedom to speak as a citizen about matters of public concern. In this talk, I am going, only going to be talking about one of these dimensions, freedom of research and publication, because it's the core notion of academic freedom and it's the one that most in need of theoretical clarification. So this idea of academic freedom as freedom of research and publication emerges simultaneously with the transformation of the American university into a research institution. And it is most captured by John Dewey in 1902 in a, in a formulation that I'll come back to throughout this lecture. It's a, I think it's an absolutely precise and illuminating but difficult formulation. John Dewey said this, 1902, in discussing the questions summed up in the phrase academic freedom, it is necessary to make a distinction between the university proper, the university proper, and those teaching bodies called by whatever name whose primary business is to inculcate a fixed set of ideas and facts. The former, the university proper, aims to discover and communicate truth and to make its recipients better judges of truth and more effective in applying truth to the affairs of life. The latter, that the institutions communicating merely fixed beliefs, the latter have as their aim the perpetuation of a certain way of looking at things current among a given body of persons. Their purpose is to disciple rather than to discipline. The problem of freedom of inquiry and instruction clearly assumes different forms in these two types of institutions. So academic freedom, says John Dewey, is the freedom to discipline, but not the freedom to disciple. That's a crucial distinction. The freedom of disciple is to make people look like me, believe what I believe, think of a um, a, a, a parochial university that has received uh, theological truths and, it, and its job is to make disciples, people who agree with those theological truths. But if the mission of the university is to create new knowledge, its mission is to discipline, which is to say to give persons the tools to discover truths and that implies, which is the premise of all academic freedom, that truths are discovered through disciplines academic disciplines through discipline. And so it's that notion that we're going to have to unpack um, as we think through these issues. Um, it's plain, though, that Dewey's formulation uh, is embodied in the first and greatest statement of what academic freedom is in the United States. This is the AAUP, the American Association of Universities Professors, um, 1915 Declaration of Principles of Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure. It's no surprise he was the first president of the AAUP, and he was intimately involved in the drafting of this statement. Um, and the declaration justifies academic freedom of research and publication on the ground that universities cannot fulfill their purpose 
Their purpose is, according to the Declaration, to promote inquiry and to advance the sum of human knowledge. They cannot achieve that purpose unless they award faculty, quote, complete and unlimited freedom to pursue inquiry and publish its results. Such freedom is the breath in the nostrils of all scientific activity. So you have to have freedom to pursue inquiry and publish results in order to make new knowledge, to advance knowledge, to discover knowledge. But what kind of freedom is necessary in order to advance knowledge? The Declaration explicitly repudiates the position, quote, that academic freedom implies that individual teachers should be exempt from all restraints as to the matter or manner of their utterances, either within or without the university. And it says instead that academic freedom implies, quote, the liberty of the scholar within the university to set forth his conclusions, be they what they may, conditioned by their being conclusions gained by a scholar's method and held in a scholar's spirit. That is to say, they must be the fruits of competent and patient and sincere inquiry. So academic freedom, according to the Declaration, is the freedom to pursue, quote, the scholar's profession, end quote, according to the standards of that profession. The Declaration says that academic freedom is, and I'm quoting again, not, not the absolute freedom of utterance of the individual scholar, but the absolute freedom of thought, of inquiry, of discussion, and of teaching of the academic profession. So what does it mean to say the freedom of a profession? What defines the profession? What defines the profession are the disciplinary norms by which the profession is organized, by which it perpetuates itself. So academic freedom is the freedom, according to the Declaration of precisely what Dewey said, the freedom to participate in a discipline according to the terms of that discipline. And why do we have that freedom as academic freedom? Because knowledge is produced by disciplinary expertise. Now, when we say knowledge, I'm not talking about sensory knowledge, like I see that you're out there in an audience. That is not knowledge that's produced by disciplinary expertise, but knowledge about the various forms of inquiry that characterize the modern university. What is the half-life of plutonium? Does nicotine cause cancer? Is the world, is world climate growing warmer? These are not matters one understands by direct sensory apprehension. These are matters determined by expertise. What is expertise? Expertise are the disciplinary methods that define the scholarly enterprise. So what does that tell us? That tells us that academic freedom always rests upon a double recognition. It rests upon, first, the idea that knowledge cannot be advanced in the absence of free inquiry. I can't advance knowledge unless I'm free to critique existing knowledge. So I have to have freedom of inquiry. But second, it depends upon what Robert Hutchins said when he explored the question. The right question to ask about a professor is whether he is competent. And that's because only competent people advance disciplinary knowledge. And universities uh, assess competence all the time. Universities decide whether to hire someone based upon whether they're competent. They decide whether to promote someone to tenure based upon whether they're competent. They decide whether to give a grant depending upon whether someone is competent. They decide to promote or steps or um, uh, give certain classes to people depending on whether they're competent. Universities are machines for the assessment of competence. And what is the assessment of competence? The determination of proficiency within the very disciplinary norms that define and produce the knowledge knowledge, which it is the mission of the university to advance. So universities do two things. They provide a space of critical inquiry, and they assess competence. They enforce disciplinary norms. Universities, that's the, that's the most common activity of any university. All right, now, let's think about this from the perspective of constitutional law. What should constitutional academic freedom be? The court, as I mentioned to you, thinks that it knows why we have constitutional academic freedom because of the marketplace of ideas. This notion of the marketplace of ideas was first set forth in American law. It goes back to John Stuart Mill and farther back perhaps to Milton, but in American constitutional law, it goes back to 1919 and Justice Holmes' uh, very justly famous dissent in Abrams versus United States. Justice Holmes said this, quoting him, but when men have realized that time has upset many fighting face, 
faiths, they may come to believe, even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. And the United States Supreme Court has since then many times said uh, that we protect First Amendment rights because of the marketplace of ideas, because that's how we get to truth. That's how we get um, to knowledge. And the premise of the marketplace of ideas is if everyone talks, if there's a clash of opposing ideas, um, you will get um, to truth. And the doctrine which follows, the first uh, constitutional doctrine, which follows from the marketplace of ideas is the state shouldn't intervene to disrupt the market. It shouldn't say, you win, you lose. The state has to be strictly neutral in the marketplace of ideas. So we have very fundamental First Amendment rules of doctrine called content neutrality and viewpoint neutrality. And they mean, basically, to quote a judicial decision, uh, courts should apply the most exacting scrutiny to regulations that suppress, disadvantage, or impose differential burdens upon speech because of its content. Right? So the state can't say this is a good idea, that's a bad idea. That's the marketplace of ideas. Now put that side by side with the university. Universities always say this is a good idea, this is a bad idea. Universities say that's a bad idea, I'm not going to hire you. That's a bad idea, I don't give you tenure. That's a really good idea, you get tenure. That's a really, really good idea, I'll give you a grant, or something like that. Right? So if the point of academic freedom is to advance knowledge, we don't actually do it according to the marketplace of ideas. We don't say first come, first serve, and anybody can say everything. We, all, we have pervasive mechanisms for understanding and regulating um, competence. And if you want to see how this works most fundamentally, the basic unit of the, the basic doctrinal stance of the marketplace of ideas is that, to quote the Supreme Court again, there is no such thing as a false idea for purposes of the First Amendment. Well, if there's no such thing as a false idea, there can be no such thing as a true idea. And that means, what's the function of the university in advancing knowledge if there's no such thing as true ideas? These things simply um, don't go together. And if you look at the structure of the disciplines, which as members of a faculty we all participate, it's based on an entirely different social conception than the marketplace of ideas. If we go back to the OED, for example, it talks about disciplinarity as the training of scholars or subordinates to proper or orderly action by instructing or exercising them. Disciplines are not organized according to the marketplace of ideas. They're hierarchical, they're authoritative, there are measures of authority within it, which are quite distinct from this idea of an open marketplace. Uh, just to, I mean, just pick a simple example. Um, most of you probably uh, publish in disciplinary journals, first-rate disciplinary journals like you know, American Economic Review or Nature or Lancet. right? Do any of these journals, which are the gatekeepers to disciplinary knowledge, use a marketplace of ideas? Do they say, first come, first serve, I'll publish anything? Or do they screen for quality? Do they engage in content discrimination? Of course they do. That's their job, is to decide what's a good example, what's more competent, what's less competent. No place in this society which actually produces knowledge functions according to a marketplace of ideas which is one reason why the academic freedom as a constitutional matter is, um, uh, is, is um, completely incoherent, all right? So that's, that's the problem that we have to deal with. So how then are we going to justify a constitutional law of academic freedom if not by the marketplace of ideas? This is actually a very deep puzzle. And it's a deeper puzzle the more you know about the First Amendment. So First Amendment, of course, prohibits the state from regulating speech. So why do we do such a thing? Your first thought, I'm sure, is that speech is valuable, and therefore speech should be protected as distinct from conduct. Um, well, if you're going to take that line, you're going to have to say, what is speech and what's conduct? So we all have a paradigmatic view of what speech is. I'm speaking now, and if I go out and I you know, throw rocks, I'm not speaking, I'm throwing rocks. And so you all get that. So then you say, now, well, well, how do I know whether a given behavior is speech? or whether it's conduct. And I'll bet most of you, if you think about that, will say, you'll know it's speech if it's really trying to communicate and successfully does communicate an idea. Because that's the essence of speech. We want to protect the distribution of ideas. This is what the Supreme Court has said when it's bothered to think about this question. Um, but uh, that actually won't work. 
If uh, you come into my neighborhood and I don't like your kind of people and I throw a rock through your window, you get the idea. You know I'm sending you a message saying you're unwelcome here, and yet no one would classify that as speech. Right? No one would protect it as speech. It's a form of conduct. The people who flew the planes into the trade towers knew very well that they were communicating a message. They would have no First Amendment defense. Or conversely, there are lots, millions of social situations where people actually talk to you and you get the idea and the First Amendment doesn't apply. So you go to your doctor and he tells you, you know, you need an operation because you have X, Y, or Z. And it turns out he's wrong. It's malpractice and you sue for malpractice. The doctor doesn't get to say, you know, I have a First Amendment defense. It was an experiment, as all life is an experiment. We hold doctors accountable for their speech. No First Amendment defense. We hold, product li we hold products liable for their warnings. We, hold, we enforce contracts, even though there's speech. So this idea that there's speech and there's action, it actually doesn't work very well uh, to our world for very deep reasons. We actually have to go the other way. What we have to say is, well, we define as speech those forms of behavior which serve the purposes of why we want to have a First Amendment. So that pushes us back. Why do we want a First Amendment? Right? So one purpose might be uh, the marketplace of ideas to produce knowledge. I've already suggested to you I don't think that works at all because in the social set settings that produce knowledge, we do not see anything like the rules of no content discrimination, no viewpoint discrimination. We actually see the reverse. We see people making great efforts to separate the good from the not so good. So a second value that we say we protect speech is autonomy. One hears that a lot. Let me just say that that actually doesn't help much because autonomy doesn't lead any more to speech than it leads to long hair or certain kind of clothes or certain kind of drug use or many things would be autonomy as much as speech. And when we see how we regulate speech, it doesn't turn on autonomy. I just give a, a simple example which will come up later in the lecture. If I'm the state and I'm regulating my employees, which I have to do all the time, which means I have to regulate their speech, and uh, the employee wants to say, you can't regulate this speech, we allow the, st we allow the state to regulate the speech so long as it is not about a matter of public concern. But if it is about, about a, if, the, if this employee speech is about a matter of public concern, then we have a First Amendment issue. So what's triggering the distinction between constitutional coverage and non-constitutional coverage has something to do with the public sphere, public concern. We see this again and again, not the autonomy of the speaker. It doesn't turn on whether the speaker is actually feeling their autonomy more or less at stake. So what do we make about this notion of um, the public. It, this happens all over the place. Just to give you, to build on the example I gave you before, the doctor says to you, uh, here's, a, here's an example I've written about. You know silver fillings in your teeth? They consist of an amalgam of uh, mercury and uh, silver. You, uh, the mercury, you know, is very toxic. And many dentists believe that the mercury leached out of the silver fillings and caused you uh, problems, could cause you uh, Alzheimer's, could cause you ALS, could cause you a bunch of things. And they wanted to get their patients to take out their silver fillings and remove them. The American Dental Society did all these studies and the best scientific knowledge, I'm talking now as of a decade ago, not so true now, but as of a decade ago, um, it was felt that silver fillings are completely safe, there's no evidence. So the doctor who uh, asked you to remove your silver fillings would actually get their license pulled. They'd be sanctioned for malpractice because considerable risk to the patient, no gain to the patient, that's malpractice. Right? So if, my, if I go to my dentist and, and the dentist says, you've got to remove all your silver fillings, that dentist gets it's punished. And there's no First Amendment defense, given the science available. That same dentist goes on the Oprah Winfrey show and says, you know, there's mercury in silver fillings. He says to the TV audience, you should get them out. And somebody in the audience goes, gets their silver fillings out. And it turns out not to be true, sues the dentist. First Amendment defense. Why is that? Because when the dentist is talking to me, they're practicing dentistry. When they're talking on the Oprah Winfrey show, they're talking to the public. So the constitutional protections kick in when one enters this public um, sphere. Why is that? Now, I, I can't defend this. I can just assert it, and I'm happy to take questions about it. But this would be consistent with my more general view of the First Amendment. The First Amendment, um, we, we have a First Amendment to protect the forms of speech which are necessary for democratic self-governance. A democratic governance, a democratic government is one in which the people are both the subjects of the law and the authors of the law. It's self-government. We're governing ourselves. How do we govern ourselves? 
uh, when, say, I lose every election I ever vote in? How is it that I'm governing myself? The answer is, in modernity, that you are free to participate in the, um, in the formation of public opinion, and we make government responsive to public opinion. Notice this word public coming in again. Um, and when we tend to see freedom of speech, it tends to be the freedom to participate in the formation of public opinion. And so when I participate in the formation of public opinion and I create a system in which the state is made dependent upon or responsive to public opinion, that's what we tend to consider as democratic self-governance. And that tends to be why um, we have um, a First Amendment. And the First Amendment, therefore, is um, designed to allow all of us to participate in public, uh, public opinion formation equally. And that depends not upon an equality of ideas. It's not that your idea is as good as my idea. It's rather an equality of persons. We each have the equal right to be self-governed. We each, as a person, have the equal right, therefore, to participate in the formation of public opinion. What we're talking about here is a democratic equality, which gets translated into the standard doctrinal rules I was talking about, about no content discrimination, no viewpoint discrimination. Your view is as good as mine when it comes to governing ourselves. Right? But now, I hope, you get a, a sense of how uh, puzzling academic freedom is because what the First Amendment is doing is it's reducing all knowledge to opinion, public opinion. You have an idea about climate change. I have an idea about climate change. The state can't intervene to adjudicate between us. There's no knowledge in the public sphere. The public sphere is the clash of public opinion. And so the First Amendment becomes a giant engine of, of um, deconstruction, where we just have opinions fighting each other. And there is no disciplinary authority in the public sphere. So just to put this in a simple, um, a simple um, uh, way, uh, suppose you have a young astronomer, an untenured astronomer on your faculty, and he writes an editorial in the New York Times that says the moon is made of green cheese. Well, the First Amendment says that's his opinion. You can't punish him for the New York Times. But a university department of astronomy does not give someone tenure for saying the moon is made of green cheese. So you see the difference in the way speech is regarded. The university department has to make a judgment about academic competence, and the First Amendment precludes that judgment. So how are we going to get to a constitutional law of academic freedom? That's the puzzle on the table. It's certainly not going to be by way of the marketplace of ideas, or universities couldn't do their end. So I want to begin to unpack that puzzle um, by um, looking at what it means to have um, self-governance. And what I want to say is the way in which our First Amendment is ordinarily interpreted really has to do with a value, call it democratic legitimation. We interpret the First Amendment such that people can participate in the formation of public opinion. I'll call that public discourse from now on. Um, people can participate in public discourse in ways that make the government responsive to them. So it gives the government, it endows the government with a democratic legitimacy. Um, I think if you unpack, if you think about that notion of democratic legitimacy in the modern world, there's, there's, a, there's an element to it which is interesting and connected to academic freedom. And that element I want to call democratic competence. Democratic competence, by that value, I'm referring to the cognitive empowerment of people within public discourse. So a modern state governs on the basis of knowledge. It tells you this is what we need to do to have to increase growth. This is what we need to do to have urban planning. It's all a knowledge-based form of governance. If the government could tell you what you think you know, if it could determine your own knowledge, self-governance would be a farce. Because if you would be responsive to a government that was telling you what you needed to know in order to make the government responsive to you. And you need to know a lot of things in order to imagine that the government is um, responsive to you. And that, you know, this thought that, uh, that, uh, that governments can consume the sphere of knowledge and manipulate as it, as it wishes, this is a thought that has arisen since the beginning of totalitarian regimes, like Senko in the Soviet Union, who was a biologist right? in, in the Soviet Union. Under Stalin, uh, everything had to be Marxist, which means everything had to be uh, environmental. Nothing could be innate, which means there could be no genes, 
there could be no science of genetics. And as a result, Stalin says, uh, Lysenko, you're in charge of Soviet biology, and Soviet biology is put behind you know, decades and decades because of the political controlling the sphere of knowledge. Even so great a Democrat, and there probably has been no greater Democrat in the United States than John Dewey, says this. He says that opinions and beliefs concerning the public presuppose effective and organized inquiry, and that genuine public policy cannot be generated unless it be informed by knowledge. And this knowledge does not exist except where there is systematic, thorough, and well-equipped search and record. The person, I think, who summarizes this best is the French political theorist Claude Lefour. Um, he distinguishes democratic from totalitarian regimes on the ground that in totalitarian regimes, quote, a condensation takes place between the sphere of power, the sphere of law, and the sphere of knowledge. Knowledge of the ultimate goals of society and of the norms which regulate social practices becomes the property of power, and at the same time, power itself claims to be the organ of discourse which articulates the real as such. So democratic legitimation cannot exist without some form of democratic competence upon those of us who wish to govern ourselves. If you deprive us of our knowledge, we cannot govern ourselves. So how do we get that knowledge? Notice, once we say that, we're, we're dealing with a problem. Because under the First Amendment, what we have is the freedom to participate in the um, formation of public opinion, not public knowledge. If you are an expert and you put your hat into the public ring, nobody authorizes you as an expert. Compare that to the doctor, where we use the law to underwrite expertise. That is to say, when we use the laws of malpractice, we're saying the doctor actually has to be an expert and we enforce the best practices for lawyers and for doctors and for architects and their speech. So we very sharply demarcate the sphere of public discourse, the sphere of public opinion formation, where the First Amendment allows us to say what we will without regulation by the state, and other spheres of knowledge production in which we use the law, rather typically in the malpractice case I just gave you, to uphold the importance and reliance of persons on real knowledge. Right? So we see that in the law. Do we see it constitutionally? And I think we do. So I'll give you a simple example. Nebraska, just, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of wars about abortion. And a lot of times when states want to regulate abortion, they do it by regulating the doctor-patient relationship. So Nebraska did so by requiring a doctor to tell a patient who wanted to get an abortion a lot of false things like you're going to have a statistically significant chance of severe psychological trauma. Not true, but the state by law required the doctor to say this false thing to the patient. So it's an interesting question. The doctor sues saying my First Amendment rights are at stake. Now, th th this is a, 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 um, a one-off case, but I think it's very robust. If your intuitions are that the doctor does have a First Amendment right, not to be false, forced to say false things to the patient by the state, by the sphere of the political, intruding on the sphere of the professional, of expert medical knowledge. Um, uh, how do you reconcile that with ordinary malpractice law, where we force doctors to say things or not say things without any First Amendment defense? And the only way I think you can reconcile that is what the First Amendment is doing here. It's not the doctor's right to speak speak true, speak not true. It's th rather that the profession's right not to be forced to convey false information is at stake. The doctor is saying, don't compel me to violate the channel of the distribution of expert medical knowledge here by false things. But you can use the law without my First Amendment rights interfering to force me to do what's, what expert knowledge would require, namely to give you the right advice, to give you the right warnings, et cetera. And we see this both in the area of law. In the recent Bankruptcy Act, for example, the law forbade lawyers from giving certain true advice to clients. And everyone agreed there'd be a First Amendment problem if the law were interpreted to do that. So when politics intervenes in these areas of the distribution of expert knowledge to either compel the distribution of false knowledge or to preclude the distribution of true knowledge, we see the First Amendment kick in. 
Now that's a sign that we use the First Amendment to further the value of democratic competence, namely the cognitive empowerment of persons when they enter public discourse. They have a right to know what's actually uh, true. And now the next question, of course, comes up, which is the deepest question. How does the state, how did the district court that struck down the Nebraska statute know that it was false to say to women that they had a statistically significant risk of severe psychological trauma? And the court says, the First Amendment right of the physician is violated because you force the doctor to say something false. How does the court know it's false? I, I take it the only way the court could have known that it was false is they brought in experts to testify. And which experts did they bring in? Public health experts, medical experts. Right? So medical experts are the boundary of the constitutional forms of protection that this distribution of expertise is about. Now, if we pursue that line of inquiry to its uh, foundations, what we discover is that the First Amendment protections are not going to any given proposition, true or false. They're going to the knowledge practices by which it is determined what's true and false. That's where the constitutional protections are kicking in. And of course, once you see that, then we're in a, a position to understand academic freedom as a constitutional concept. Because where do the disciplinary practices come from that define expert medical knowledge or expert public health knowledge come from academics? The universe, I mean, we get knowledge from lots of institutions in society, from Xerox Park, from corporations. And there's lots of places that knowledge comes from in the society, but there's only one institution that defines and protects and refurbishes and perpetuates the disciplinary norms by which we define what knowledge is and isn't. And that's universities. That's what we do. We turn out the next generation of experts. We define by our, um, by our maintenance of disciplinary standards what are the appropriate disciplinary standards and not. And so once we see that, then we can see that the ob if, if we have, in fact, as I think we do, a constitutional value in democratic competence and preserving knowledge practices from their degradation by the political influences of the state, if we have such a constitutional interest, and as I've argued, you can see it in these obscure corners, if that's true, then, then, in, then we certainly have an interest in preserving the disciplinary practices by which that knowledge is recognized and defined and furthered. And that is the university, and that is precisely the disciplinary norms which we've seen are at the core of academic freedom itself. Right? So that is telling us what the constitutional foundations of academic freedom should be, not the individual right of a professor, nor the institutional right of a university. The core is the disciplinary norms that create knowledge, which must remain in a standard liberal way, distinct from the uncontrolled disciplinary, uh, uh, political power of the state. So let me then, uh, in the last part of this, just turn to some legal puzzles that afflict the um, constitutional law of academic freedom and show you how conceiving it in this way changes utterly the debates and the incoherences which attend to academic freedom currently understood as a constitutional doctrine. So um, I'm going to talk about three puzzles. The first is, does academic freedom apply to the university or to the individual professor? And you can see how these might come into conflict. Suppose an individual professor sues a university for not tenuring the professor. And the university says, my academic freedom is at stake. I'm defining the field this way. And the professor says, no, my academic freedom is at stake because I have the individual right to define my own research project. Well, which is academic freedom, the university or the professor? This kind of conflict comes into view all the time when we attempt to apply the constitutional law of academic freedom. And there's a, there's a small literature out there of people who say, no, it belongs to the professor, no, it belongs to the university, et cetera, et cetera. And if you follow the argument I've made so far, you would say a plague on both your houses. You're both wrong. It belongs neither to the professor nor to the university. Academic freedom as a constitutional uh, principle has as its object the disciplinary practices that inform the academic profession. Not the individual professor, not the university, but the disciplinary practices that define the disciplinary knowledge which it is the function of the university to, uh, uh, to pursue. 
And sometimes, if, if the university is betraying those disciplinary practices, um, then the university is to be at fault. If the professor is betraying those disciplinary practices, then the professor gets no sympathy. But the court's issue is, how do we protect those disciplinary practices? So it's neither one of those two. If you formulate it as an individual versus an institution, there's no way out, and there's no coherent solution. But if you formulate it functionally, according to this value of democratic competence, you can trace it down to why we have universities in the first place, and then that should guide a court in its application of the principles of academic freedom. So a second puzzle that we see very much um, uh, in, in the a constitutional law of academic freedom um, is about when does academic freedom kick in? And what one sees in this context is uh, courts, uh, I would say the vast majority of courts say that one has academic freedom, if one is a professor, only when one is speaking about a matter of public concern. A matter of public concern. You saw I used that phrase before. The court gets this phrase from cases dealing with public employees, from cases like Pickering versus Board of Education, Connick versus Myers, and Waters versus Churchill. So let me talk a little bit about those cases and how they intersect with uh, the issue of academic freedom because the court is here assimilating professors to state employees, and it's using the model of the employee to uh, delimit the boundaries of academic freedom. So um, I've said to you that democratic legitimation, which is the core of the First Amendment, requires us to keep open the processes of public opinion formation. We are always free to go in and try to change public opinion. right? But when we are debating each other in public opinion, what are we debating each other about? We're debating each other about what the government is to do. How does the government do anything? Well, the typical way in which the modern state does something is it creates an organization to do it. So if we want to create a social security system, we create a social security administration. Right? So an organization is an arrangement of people and resources designed to accomplish a purpose. They're purposive. They're, uh, they're organized according to the logic of instrumental reason. We create a social security administration to administer social security. We create courts to dispense justice. We create a military to defend ourselves. We create classrooms to educate. Okay? Now, um, people reside within these organizations, and when you create an organization like this, you have to organize resources like tables and chairs. You have to bring them to the purpose of the organization. You also have to bring the, perp the people, right? They have to work certain hours, they have, to do, they have to attend certain meetings, and when you manage the people, you're also managing their speech. Uh, within an organization, we regulate speech routinely. You know, a bureaucrat comes in to a state supervisor, and the state supervisor says, I want to review the paper you're going to give to Congress before you give it. I want you to take this position, not that position. It violates every First Amendment rule. It's discretionary, it's prior restraint, it's content discretion, all that. But that's because it's within an organization that's doing a purpose. Right? Now, suppose somebody is in the organization, and they, want to, they don't want to be an employee, they want to be a citizen. They want to speak out and participate in the formation of public opinion. Um, then they, the, the person who's in the police department, say, wants to speak out against uh, a bond issue, and the police department wants to discipline them. So when the policeman speaks out, is the policeman speaking as a citizen or as an employee? As an employee, of course, it can be regulated in an instrumental matter. As a citizen, he has to have liberty to speak. So which is it? And the answer is, of course, it isn't one or another. It's how we characterize it. And the courts have used this notion of public concern to draw the boundary between someone speaking as a citizen and someone speaking as, a, as an employee. So if you speak as about a matter of public concern, you have a claim that you're speaking as a citizen and therefore that your speech should be protected according to the First Amendment rules that we've discussed. Whereas if you're not speaking about a matter of, of public concern, then you're just within the organizational instrumental logic of the organization. Now, what is the organization of a university? It's to create knowledge, right? So when I speak out as a professor, you could say, that's my job. Right? And I should be, um, I, and I can be regulated according to the instrumental logic of my job. What we've just said, the instrumental logic of your job is requiring academic freedom. I can't do my job unless I have academic freedom. And so you could make the argument that it's an incorrect form of instrumental reason to attempt to regulate me when I'm publishing the results of my research, academic research and freedom. But even more deeply than that the, the, uh, is the fact that the of public concern test 
is delineating the boundary of my speaking as a citizen. And academic freedom has ver of, of research and publication has very little to do with my freedom as a citizen. It's everything to do with my role as a professor designed to advance the mission of the university, which is to create and disseminate new knowledge. So it shouldn't matter whether I'm creating new knowledge about Hittites, about which there happens to be no public concern, or I'm creating new knowledge about global warming, about which there might be public. That's irrelevant to my job. My job is to create new knowledge. And so the public concern test is a complete irrelevancy and a mistake in the concept of, in the context of constitutional principles of academic freedom. It's derived from the value of democratic legitimation. But we are deriving academic freedom not from democratic legitimation, my ability to participate as a citizen. It's derived instead from the value of democratic competence, my ability to advance knowledge. And so from the get-go, this, uh, this public concern test is just a mistake. And we should abandon it as quickly and as thoroughly as we can. So that's the second um, uh, puzzle. Um, if I should say, if public concern concerns anything, it's this branch of academic freedom I was mentioning earlier called extramural speech, which gives us as professors the right to speak as citizens, even though we're speaking as citizens about matters that have nothing to do with our scholarship. And it's never been clear, I want to say, as a professional matter, exactly what grounded that as a claim of academic freedom. But uh, 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 whatever that is, it concerns that branch of academic freedom, but not the branch of, of research and publication. It has nothing to do with the core notion of publication and, and uh, research. OK, now I want to speak about a third puzzle, which gets to the Garcetti case, which Peggy talked about um, at the outset. There is a second line of Supreme Court precedent which has been used to limit and uh, constrain academic freedom in the constitutional context. And this line ultimately traces back uh, not to Garcetti, but before that, many years before that, to a case called Hazelwood School District versus Kohlmeyer. And in that case, the court held that a secondary school was authorized to restrict or compel speech as necessary in order to fulfill its chosen curriculum. So, um, I wanted, uh, the, the school said to a teacher, you have to teach math. And the teacher starts talking about the election. And the school district says, no, you have to talk about what's relevant to, to your course. And so uh, the, the Hazelwood case gives the authority to the school district as an employer to determine what it is that the, um, the teacher is going to say or not say. So this plays out also in the context of higher education. A good example is the case called Bishop versus Aronoff, in that a university professor was instructed to refrain from interjecting his religious beliefs or preferences during his instructional time periods. And in, in upholding the university's ability to restrict the professor, the court cited um, the Kohlmeyer case, which I just talked about. And it said this, quoting, as a place of schooling with a teaching mission, we consider the university's authority reasonably to control the content of its curriculum, particularly that content imparted during class time. Tangential to the authority over its curriculum, there lies some authority over the conduct of teachers in and out of the classroom that significantly bears on the curriculum or that gives it the appearance of endorsement by the university. And so starting from that premise, the court in Aronoff concluded, quote, though we are mindful of the invaluable role academic freedom plays in our public schools, particularly at the post-secondary level, we do not find support to conclude that academic freedom is an independent First Amendment right. We don't because the school is hiring you to do something, and therefore you should, uh, you should uh, do it. Now, um, I would say the first thing I, I would think about in looking at this case is that if it concerns anything, it would concern a constitutional principle of academic freedom dealing with freedom of teaching. And I have so far said nothing about freedom of teaching one way or the other. That would be a very complex argument that Felix Frankfurter sketches out in a case called Riemann versus Updegraff. It has something to do with the fact that democracies need trained citizens, citizens trained to think in a certain way. Professors do that, therefore they have to have a constitutional freedom to do that. But we're just now looking at freedom of research and publication, and in that context, the, free, the classroom would be read this way. I have the freedom to disseminate the results of my research to the public and to my students. Because I can't make the next generation of disciplinary competent students unless I can teach them what I know, what I have learned through my own research. So at a minimum, 
freedom of research and publication includes freedom in the classroom. But if we look at it from um, that perspective, uh, Aronov doesn't seem to be a case about academic freedom at all. And that's because in that case, the professor was teaching a class in exercise physiology, and the classroom remarks for which he was penalized included remarks like this. God came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, and he has something to tell us about life, which is crucial to success and happiness. That doesn't seem to be the fruit of research, or um, it seems rather to be uh, remarks about the person's ability to teach the class in the way, way in which they want to teach it. But this is not reporting the fruits of scholarly research um, in the classroom. But we do, have this, uh, we do have this problem come up in the more recent case, which um, Peggy was talking about, the Garcetti versus Sabalos case. And in that case, the court held that when public employees make statements pursuant to their official duties, the employees are not speaking as citizens for First Amendment purposes, and the Constitution does not insulate their communications from employer discipline. Right? So this is a generalization of the Kuhlmeier case that I told you before. And in the secondary school context, courts have, been, have held this, that um, there's no academic freedom in the classroom because, quote, a school system does not regulate teacher speech as much as it hires that speech. Expression is a teacher's stock and trade, the commodity she sells to her employer in exchange for a salary. So in the secondary school context, and there's no academic, because of Garcetti, there can't be academic freedom in the classroom, even to report research. And in the higher, in the context of higher education, public universities, some courts have interpreted Garcetti to mean, quoting now, in order for a public employee to raise a successful First Amendment claim, he must have spoken in his capacity as a private citizen and not as an employee. Now, that's a very odd claim, because my academic freedom comes out of my status as an employee. It's precisely because I'm hired to advance knowledge that I need academic freedom. And I can't do my job as an employee unless I have academic freedom. Right? So this is a complete misunderstanding of the relationship of academic freedom to the job as an employee that professors have in higher education. And Garcetti, recognizing the tension, said we're not going to reach the question of academic freedom. But um, to forestall this very logic, I should point out, the declaration, as Peggy pointed out, in 1915 said, actually, professors aren't uh, employees at all. So let me read you that passage. It's actually quite a prescient passage. They said this, 1915. Once appointed, the scholar has professional functions to perform in which the appointing authorities have neither competency nor moral right to intervene. The responsibility of the university teacher is primarily to the public itself and to his judgment of his own profession. And while with respect to certain external conditions of his vocation, he accepts a responsibility to the authorities of the institution in which he serves, in the essentials of his professional activity, his duty is to the wider public to which the institution itself is morally amenable. So far as the university's teacher's independence of thought and utterance is concerned, though not in other regards, the relationship of professor to trustees may be compared to that between judges of the federal courts and the executive who appoints them. University teachers should be understood to be, with respect to the conclusions reached and expressed by them, no more subject to the control of the trustees than are the judges subject to the control of the president with respect to their decisions. While, of course, for the same reason, trustees are no more to be held responsible for or to be presumed to agree with the opinions or utterances of professors than the president can be assumed to approve of the legal reasonings of the courts. So just like judges are appointees, not employees of the president, so we are appointees of the university to have a professional function to use these disciplinary norms to achieve um, knowledge. That's what the, the, um, uh, the, the 1915 declaration says. If you follow that logic, then Garcetti, of course, would be inapplicable because they are imagining an instrumental control of manager and employee. We are not under the instrumental control. We are not the mouthpiece of our employer. Our employer technically is the university. But we don't speak for the university when we publish our own views. We speak for the profession. And the real harm of Garcetti is the failure to understand this intermediate position, this, the intervention, the, 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 standard, uh, the standards, the importance of these disciplinary norms standing between the university as an employer, which it is, and the professor standing as an employee, which we are. 
but we're a special kind of employee. We are a professional, and the primary duty is to the professional norms. The primary duty is to the professional norms because the norms are that which define and advance the very mission of the university. That mission is to increase knowledge, and the argument I made to you is the independence of knowledge creation has constitutional foundations in the value I'm calling democratic competence. And insofar as that is true, then there are constitutional foundations upon which we can construct a coherent and a useful doctrine of academic freedom. So I'll stop there. Maybe make some observations about the way in which, in popular press and popular discourse, the term professorial has come to be associated with negative characteristics, for example, in a political figure, and the term bunch of experts has also come to be negatively inflected. And so, is there a dimension to the defense of the idea of disciplinary expertise that can be mounted effectively in an environment? What suggestions would you make about a defense of disciplinary expertise? Expertise in an environment where professorial and expert are both negatively charged. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a problem. You know that uh, you know professors are long hairs who are, you know, out of it. But on the other hand, the American professoriate was founded in the progressive era as a set of disciplinary societies in the tradition of public service. So in many, many departments, professors understood themselves, particularly in land-grant universities like this one, uh, professors understood themselves as servicing the public, providing an expertise to the public, which helps the society at large. You know? And when we imagine, if I, when I write about academic freedom as a, as a subject and I talk to my colleagues, the only concept that they have of academic freedom is the individual right associated with freedom of speech. And if all we have is a freedom of speech that no one else has, it's a very difficult thing to defend why we should have this special prerogative academic freedom. On the other hand, if, this, if academic freedom is a compact between the university and the larger society, because the university is actually doing something that the larger society needs, and here we don't need to imagine that in a narrowly utilitarian or welfareist way, the way they have in England, you know, where they have these forms to the English departments, how much have you contributed to the economy, and they distribute, um, uh, um, uh, uh, public monies based upon your actual contributions to economic growth, that's a mistake. But we have to have a broad notion of the contribution of what we do to the public education. Um, I, um, I'm teaching a class on decision making and I had John Kerry in the class last Thursday and he was using professorial in exactly this way and uh, was talking about, you know, and then at the same breath was talking about how these uh, people in the Tea Party, if you go back and read Tea Party manifestos, which I do a fair amount, you will see that one of their premises is always an anti-expertise. They hate expertise. They hate knowledge because they want to have an opinion as good as anybody else's. And once you make that move, of course, um, a lot follows in the public life of the country. And Kerry, on the one hand, was using professorial the way you were, and on the other hand, was talking about these yahoos who don't accept the scientific findings about climate change, about which he cares passionately. And one student says, well, she's saying, you know, how do you reconcile these attitudes toward the professoriate since you're getting that knowledge about climate change from all these people who are, in fact, professorial? He got very embarrassed. Let me um, address the question of breadth of uh, what we're defending. It seems to me that um, uh, there are many, many things which we would defend with our lives, which are defense of free speech without being defense of academic freedom. So there's a, de there's a delimitation of the sphere of discourse uh, already when we speak of academic freedom. That's part of the problem. And uh, secondly, uh, we recognize that there are many things which are very precious uh, uh, aspects of academic freedom which uh, are not related to the Constitution. So that the, uh, so that the, um, the type of, of problem which you've addressed is, um, is uh, in, that, in two senses, a, a portion of a, of a larger important area. Uh, I wonder if that's related to the, qu the following question. Uh, most of your considerations concern 
the procedures for finding facts, for gaining factual knowledge. And yet we know that, uh, that the process of free speech and the process of exchange of ideas is um, very largely um, uh, not concerned with facts. It's concerned with uh, preferences. And uh, uh, we, we, um, we hope that we are exerting our, uh, our uh, uh, preferences and seeking our preferences uh, in a context of uh, uh, adequately informed uh, uh, discourse and that the facts we think we know are not wrong. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, academic freedom is not only the, uh, the uh, uh, search for facts, it's also the search for poetry. And, uh, uh, and um, so that we have, um, I, I don't know how much of your uh, argument extends beyond the limits that you've set. Um, well, I'm generally pretty careful to set the limits of an argument because um, I don't want to overclaim. And your, your, your question, I mean, first part of your question was absolutely right. We're just talking about a very small slice. It's a slice that actually matters when you're talking about legal uh, litigation, often people go to the constitutional claim, particularly public universities like Michigan. But it's, if you look at the whole scope of higher education in America, a very small slice first. Second, um, you were making a distinction between facts and everything else. Daniel Patrick Moynihan is famous for saying, you're entitled to your opinions, but not to your facts. Uh, and um, it is the case if one deals with, but I actually don't, I, I didn't use facts, I used knowledge. And knowledge is a much more complex term than facts. So I don't know whether you want to call it a theory. Uh, evolution is not, a, a may or may, I mean, it, it's tendentious, I think, to call evolution or climate change a fact. It's our best understanding of the world. It is a form of knowledge. I think knowledge is capacious enough to embrace everything that we do at a university with the possible exception of the arts. And it is actually a very complex thing how academic freedom applies to the arts. It has to probably be derived from classroom teaching rather than the production of knowledge, because I don't know whether knowledge applies to the arts. But um, I, I, I have uh, spoken before um, uh, uh, humanities centers about the question of whether the humanities are disciplinary. You know, there's a tendency of people in English departments uh, to have the, to want to claim the authority of the artist. And to me, that means claiming charismatic authority rather than disciplinary authority. And I think if you do claim charismatic authority and you're like an English professor or a French professor or something, um, you are reading out of existence 99% of your colleagues. You know, one doesn't say as a term of rebuke to a physicist, you're doing ordinary physics. You're doing just pretty good ordinary disciplinary physics. But once you say that the English professor is only there to inspire and to be charismatic, then to the guy who's just happening to be teaching Middlemarch, you're, you're saying you're worth nothing because that's all you're doing. I don't believe we should think about humanities departments that way. We actually have something to convey. We know something and we should be proud of it. Not, not, um, not defensive about it. Now, there's someone in the English department at Berkeley, at um, Yale, David Bromwich, a wonderful writer. He's got a piece, I think, in Raritan attacking this, saying we should understand academic freedom not in this disciplinary mode, because of course English is much too capacious to be put within a discipline, but in the, rather the notion it's general civil rights. The problem is nobody else but us has those civil rights. So one can't make it a civil rights argument unless you're going to reform and give it to everybody else. And then by hypothesis, it's not academic freedom. Evan. So uh, as, as I promised, I find the argument <laughs> elegant and well-crafted. I'm a little puzzled by your first puzzle. Um, I love the elegance of saying that you have a focus on the function of academic freedom that doesn't require you to choose who has the right of it when there's a conflict. But there are at least some cases in which I guess I'm not quite sure how that happens, right? Because certainly disciplines are not stable. At least some are not stable. Some undergo radical transformations in practice. That might be what GPS did to geology or geography. I mean, some of it is in conception. That may be because of new discoveries like quantum mechanics. And there will be moments of transition where both the university and the professor will be claiming that they are the, the mouthpiece of your value, right. of they have the truth, they have the, 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 the knowledge. And at least history seems to suggest that the way the discipline 
moves is in response, in a sense, to a marketplace, not of opinions, of course, but more scholars look at the same question, try and replicate experience, ex experiments, etc. cetera. Um, but there are always going to be these transitional moments when one may not be able to know if the professor who's being disciplined or not tenured because their ideas seem crazy isn't the one who's right. And, and what do you say in those cases? I think that's a brilliant question, exactly right question. Uh, but this is not a problem merely about the constitutional theory. It's a problem about academic freedom as a professional ideal. So just to give a concrete example, I was chair of the Academic Freedom Committee at Berkeley. And this person from the architecture school comes, who's very famous, and says, that my academic freedom is being violated because my work is so paradigm breaking, Cooney and paradigm breaking, so revolutionary, there should be a major in me. And the academic and the architecture department isn't allowing students to major in me, you know. Um, so this is an example of someone who wants to, you know, mitosis, change the discipline. And you know, what do you do in those situations? I don't think there's an, there's been any systemic answer. Bernard Williams, in his book on truth, um, says, look. Um, truth in the end comes from uh, the sustained attention of disciplines and nine times out of ten the people who claim to have discovered and everyone else is wrong are cranks and one time out of a hundred you're going to look like an idiot and there's just nothing you can do in retrospect except see how it plays out you have to do the best you can because if we if we make the rules for the one person in a hundred who's Galileo or whatever then that means everyone there's no judgment anymore and there's no discipline anymore that becomes like um, a marketplace truly a marketplace of ideas that's not how we do it um, and so within the very notion of how we determine who's tenure worthy or hireable, we have these same debates. And, and you know, I was conveniently, because from a certain perspective one can do it, hypostasizing the disciplines. But we all know from battles within the university, there are margins and these are, these are fought out. And I, I don't think constitutional law is the appropriate place to do that. So um, one might construct from the constitutional point of view rules of deference to certain things. You know, there's ways to mediate this. But in the end, it's elephants all the way down when you get to those cases, I think. But that's exactly the right question to ask. I wonder whether in the academic, uh, uh, even in the academic context, whether you're, you're giving up too quickly on the marketplace metaphor. And it is just a metaphor. And even, even regular marketplaces aren't perfect. So I mean, even in the academic context, aren't there marketplace uh, type manifestations? I mean, it's still true that um, uh, in many areas, at least, research is directed from the bottom up. It's still true that. Uh, if ideas get uh, uh, get attachment, more people will pay attention to it, and that will be important. And it's still true, I think, that uh, it's not a healthy sign if one journal, say, controls access. All those seem to be some kind of manifestations of marketplace. Well, they're manifestations of the fact that you know it's uh, you're not you're not dealing in the Orthodox Church of 1200, right? So you're not dealing with a, a what you're dealing what you're dealing with is uh, uh, an institution that's profoundly conceptually unstable. On the one hand like the beginning of Kant's What is Enlightenment? He says, dare to think for yourself. You have to think for yourself. And on the other hand, you have disciplinary rules. These are, uh, these are in tension with each other, but they are in tension with each other every day in a university. And when one sees the manifestations of thinking for yourself, I prefer to think about that not as a market. I prefer to think about that as how one constructs systems which gives incentives for people to be critical, to think for themselves, to have new ideas. And as we think about, um, as we think about how one goes about contending, I don't think the market is a very good way to do that. I, uh, if you give me two seconds, I'll find a wonderful quotation from Charles Peirce, you know, who was one of the great defenders of what he called the method of science, which is debate rather than authority. And then he says, but the adversary system in the marketplace is not a metaphor for the method of science. We don't, we don't, uh, we, uh, Thomas Kuhn says, the first, the first rule of scientific inquiry is you don't settle it by taking a vote. So it's not, it, it's not well analogized to preferences. It's not well analogized to me. It's more confusing than it's helpful. But the underlying point here is that the marketplace of ideas within First Amendment leads directly to certain doctrinal consequences, which are flat false, like no content discrimination, no viewpoint discrimination, et cetera, all of which are essential to the actual functioning and the healthy functioning of a university. But I'm left with a, a little bit of a, a chicken and the egg type problem with, with your formulation. And it has to do with, uh, as, you, as you're drawing, it's perhaps more in the language of the AAUP statement from 1915, but 
I'm trying to hold in my mind at the same time the idea of what you were saying, the status or the appointment nature of the person's, the professor's position in, in the academy and the idea of tenure, which of course was being discussed at that time. So oftentimes you think of uh, tenure is, is something that's inst a way to int institutionalize this independence that you're, that you're talking about. But then, you know, when you, there's sort of a, in a way, kind of a transition towards the high school case that you were, that you were talking about in the current university, when you have a, such a high percentage of people who are uh, in uh, contingent appointments and non-tenured appointments. And, you know, have we, have we made academic freedom, uh, a person's claim to academic freedom, dependent upon the nature of the position that somebody gives them within the university. So for example, suppose nowadays I hire you as a lecturer and I say, I don't allow you to, you know, you can't apply for a research grant, you're not a, a researcher, you are here to instruct. And then, then, you know, you're sort of infantile and, and Infant, <laughs> infantilizing these these people or something, you know, sort of pushing them back to the level that the court was assuming was the nature of a high school a teacher rather than a, a university professor. So that seems to me to be a very big issue because in some sense it's it's sort of eroding from within uh, the, the, the guarantee of, of academic freedom and uh, it's sort of taking a lot of speech off of the off of the table as far as this is concerned. Right. So, I mean, what you're pointing to in, in terms of the outsourcing of the profession is a huge, a horrible trend within higher education in the United States today. So, the, uh, with regard to the professional idea of academic freedom, it applies to whomever we think serves the function that mm -hmm. we want to attribute to the professoriate of expanding knowledge. Or, I would say in a lot of institutions, that's going to be a, teach, a freedom of teaching, which I haven't talked about. Yes. It's going to go there. But if we, we're just dealing now with freedom of research, whoever gets that function. In the constitutional perspective, the very first case in which the court ever articulated an academic freedom is a case called Sweezy. It comes out of New Hampshire, 57. And the defendant in that case was a guy named Paul Sweezy, a Marxist, who was brought into the University of New Hampshire to lecture, wasn't a full-time faculty member, was simply a visiting lecturer, and was subpoenaed by the New Hampshire Attorney General. And the court thought about this not in terms of the status, was he, did he have a certain kind of contract, but rather in terms of the function of people who are communicating knowledge within a classroom. And they thought about it in terms of exactly what is he communicating, is it the results of his research or not. And so thought about it functionally. And I would think that we should do this functionally, not in terms of status. Now, often the law being a world of second best, sometimes the people use proxies for that. That seems to be a mistake. I would think about it functionally, and I would say, who is serving these functions? And that's where these legal privileges should attach, both constitutionally and professionally. So you don't think something like a university has a preemptive right in such a situation to say, well, this, this person was not hired to be an independent uh, independent thinker, independent voice, independent. Well, what is the, what's the function of a university? You know, if I'm hiring um, someone, um, well, no, I mean, so a, a good example of this would be Catholic University, hire someone to teach theology. The theology is different than what, and this is a, a university that's a Vatican control, and this is a real case, AUP case. The Vatican says this person can't teach theology because it's not orthodox. To be on the AUP central list means that you're not a university doing the sort of things that universities do. You are discipling, not disciplining, to go back to the metaphor I first used. And uh, I think that, so you have to tell me in what circumstance this university can disciple and be a university. I don't know what it, you know, maybe, and I, and I think that's actually a complicated question in some instances. So for example, um, if I, I'm teaching, i just give an example out of teaching. If I give you uh, a quiz in math and there are right answers and wrong answers, that's okay because that's the nature of that discipline. There are right answers and wrong answers. If I'm in a sociology, this is an AUP case, a guy who's a Marxist sociologist and gives the class a final, true or false, the church is the agent of the ruling class for the indoctrination of the masses and gets fired for that? No, 
can't ask true or false, because that's not the nature of the sociological discipline, to expect true, those kinds of answers. So it can get complicated depending on the nature of the discipline, but whatever it is, it has to be tested against the disciplinary norms at stake. And I don't know where a university in its teaching function is discipling and not disciplining. I can't think of an instance where that would be true. Maybe if I'm a public health official and I'm hired to lecture students about you know, the use of certain kinds of drugs or you know, safe sex, and then I refuse to do that, that's an example where the university is hiring an employee not to advance knowledge, but to do certain public health functionings among their students, and that might work. That might be an example of what you're talking about, but not in the classic teaching context.